Yes. All right. All right. So welcome to the Well-Centered Woman podcast. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you and have as my very first guest speaker, Miss Rhonda Green. And she is the author of multiple books, How Much Is Your Dirt Worth? And um, the other book, now I'm drawing a blank and I have my little <laughs> notes here. Fill in 40, for me, Rhonda. 40 questions before the first date. And then I have my complimentary book, Seven Ways to Free Your Mind After Abuse. All right. And she's also uh, work, works in the legal field as well. And she's an active, ongoing co colleague and participant in, uh, in the Faith Driven Business Leaders platform on Clubhouse. And so she, um, Rhonda is a delightful lady, authentic, um, very professional, has a lot to give, a lot to offer. And I believe she just listening to her talk as we get into her testimony, as I ask these questions, and we're going to have a, a dialogue on just her journey, her process of getting real and being healed, going to the next level, managing her emotions in the process, becoming an author, and her story of domestic abuse and how she has overcome. And now she's in, in a position where she's sharing her testimony, sharing her story with other women of faith to help them come through on the other side. So welcome, Rhonda, to the Well-Centered Woman podcast. It really is an honor to have you here. Thank so, you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. So let's get started. Um, why don't you just share a little bit about your journey as an author, like starting with your very first book idea, how long did it take from the time that it, God told you to write this book, your process, the domestic abuse, and just when you actually published it, that whole situation. Well, believe it or not, I started writing How Much Is Your Dirt Worth back in about 2008, 2009. And I was slowly writing it. I didn't feel any pressure to get the book finished. And another reason I kind of put it on the back burner was because it made me deal with my past. I had to rehash things that I went through. And I wanted people to really understand that you can get past things and move on. But for me, certain things still resonated with me. So how could I write this book? And I hadn't dealt with those memories. So I put the book on the back burner. And it wasn't until about 2018, 2019, that I was in law school and God humbled me because mm. I was doing great in my classes. And then I failed a legal writing class. And so for me, it was like, what in the world? I know I can write. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. I had actually co-authored other books with other individuals, but I guess that was God's way of getting my attention to say, yeah, you know what, but you're supposed to be doing this for me. So I decided to, to take a year off and that did turn into more than one year off out of law school, but I ended up publishing the book, How Much Is Your Dirt Worth? The title of the book, some people may not get it at first, but we are made from the dust of the ground, but yet God loved us so much that he gave his only son. That's the answer to how much is your dirt worth? And the book is more about relationships, but I use personal experiences, including there's one chapter where I do talk about the abuse and things that I went through. That's the kind of thing that helps me to go deeper in my relationship with Christ. And I just want to share the love of God with others, how he will redeem you. He will restore you. He will restore the years that you lost. So that's what that book is all about. And that's how it came to be, how much your dirt is worth. Because I was focusing on abuse, I then decided to write seven ways to free your mind after abuse and put that on my website as a resource and tool for women who are still in abuse or just getting out of the abusive situation or anyone who's in a relationship and having a hard time getting past the breakup and moving back to happiness and to a space in their life where they're who they truly are at their core. Awesome, awesome. And I love this quote from the seven, seven ways to get to, to free your mind. You have this quote here. This is what you said to your point. You said, I didn't seek therapy until 20 years after my abusive relationship. 
I was in my first semester of law school. Law school is not for the faint of heart. The pressure from one area of my life brought the change needed in another area of my life. That's powerful. So the question I pose to you is, how did the pressure of being an author and starting the road to entrepreneurship as a woman of, of faith create pressure and change in other areas of your life? Because you can't just fake it till you make it. There are certain things that you have to really understand, become, do, and be before you can guide someone else. No one wants to go to a coach who doesn't know what they're doing. If you are an athlete, you want to go and play for the best coach. And so that coach can't be someone who's never played football. How are they going to coach you? Come on So now. they've got to know what they're doing. And you've got to be in a place if you really, truly want to help others and represent God in a way that will help them. You have to be guided by the Holy Spirit, but you also have to let the Holy Spirit guide you. Mm. So I had to face those things that I thought that I was over, but time does not heal all wounds. People like to say that. But at the end of the day, time just passes and it allows you to close that door. But at some point in time, you're going to open that closet door because then you got to get dressed and you got to put on some new clothes, but you still got to open the closet door and those old clothes are still hanging in there. You got to get rid of those, those things that you have outgrown so that you can truly walk in your destiny and dress to impress. And I wanted to dress to impress since we're talking about the closet here. So I had to make sure that all those things that, you know, we kind of closed the door behind, mm -hmm. were out in the open, and that I was in a place where not only, see, I didn't seek counseling 20 some years ago because I was involved in two abusive relationships. I took my daughter to counseling, but I didn't go to counseling. What? So I wanted to make sure she was okay, but I felt like I'll get over it. Mm -hmm. Now that's that's a whole we can unpack that and I don't want to keep you all <laughs> night. I don't keep want to keep all night, but you said two things. You can't fake it until you make it. Mm -hmm. You know, what's under the, you know, and the phrase that I say is what's under the rug is mm -hmm. still in your house. And we sweep stuff under mm -hmm. the rug all day long. We're sweeping and sweeping, and that pile is getting bigger and bigger, but it's still in your house. And to your and point, you're gonna trip over your it. <laughs> you're gonna trip over it, right? The big elephant in the room is now mm -hmm. making poop in the room because mm -hmm. we're not cleaning up. Yeah, exactly. And you said the closet, you got to open that closet. So it sounds like being in law school, the pressure of being in law school exposed that you still had some unresolved issues. That was like God knocking on the door of your heart saying, baby, we're going to deal with this. And mm -hmm. I found it interesting that you took, made sure that your, your baby got therapy, mm -hmm. but you didn't think, or did you, was it a worthiness issue or it's just like, I don't need, I don't have time for that. You my sure thought was, mm -hmm. my thought was I'm out of this relationship because I was in that relationship for a couple of years. So my thing was, it's behind me. I've closed the door. I finally moved on. I was proud of myself. Everybody was proud of me for getting out of the relationship that they knew was destructive to me emotionally, physically, and mentally, and even spiritually. So with everyone saying, yay, we're so glad you left him. You know, he was not good for you. You can do so much better. So everybody's patting me on the back for getting through that, but nobody's actually saying, you know what? I know you're out of that relationship, but that relationship has to get out of you. Oh, and I say geez. it that way because it takes 21 days to form a habit, right? Mm. So imagine the cycle of abuse. Abuse is a cycle. You have that honeymoon phase, then you go through, you know, like everything's fine. And then you have that trigger moment. And then you have the apology and you're back in this cycle. So you get used to mm. that cycle not realizing that it's creating another inner cycle in you. Mm. And so you get to the point where you're thinking I'm okay. So I was in that honeymoon phase with myself. So I was still in an abusive cycle, even though I was not in an abusive relationship. So there's cycles that I had to break emotionally, mm. mentally, physically, spiritually, so that I could truly move on. And if you don't know, you're even caught up in a cycle and that you've built those habits, until you get into a situation where you're self-sabotaging yourself or like, you know, some people get triggered and angry about something, but that's not the root cause. Like, you know, somebody could brush against you accidentally. Now you're mad and ready to fight, but it was truly an accident. That's not what really bothered you. What yes. really bothered you was mm -hmm. they may have gently brushed up against you, but you were reminded 
of the person who you love who would caress you and then the next thing they're hitting you. So the whole cycle had to be broken. That's right. And I love what you said. Even though I was out of the abusive cycle with the man, I still was in a cycle with myself. That is so powerful. An abusive cycle within, a, it's like a cycle within, within a cycle. You were trauma bonded to him, but you still got the trauma bonds within yourself. And if you don't deal with it, you attract the same dynamic. Because you said you had two abusive relationships. So you got out of one and went into another one. Exactly. So the first one was in college. And so that one, I was young and naive, didn't know what to expect in relationships, still navigating my way through life without being under my parents, you know, in their household. Mm -hmm. So when that happened, I was totally in shock because I did not Mm -hmm. come from that kind of home. I didn't come from that kind of environment. And at that age, I didn't even know what abuse was. I had no clue Mm -hmm. that people actually did this to each other in relationships. I get out of that relationship. A few years later, I found myself involved with someone else who was abusive. Of course, it was rosy and peachy when we first met. Mm -hmm. But I know looking back that not only did I ignore red flags, but Mm -hmm. I also ignored the Holy Spirit directly speaking to me saying, do not get involved with this person. Come on. Uh, we may have such a bad habit as women of overriding, superseding, quenching our intuition, our gut, and what we call the Holy Spirit. That's a whole different podcast right there. <laughs> That's a whole yeah. different one right yeah. there. And you had another quote in your book. You said, the first time my abuser hit me, I felt shock, shame, confusion, self-doubt, demean, and undignified. The self-doubt was the biggest one that kept coming back in other areas of my life long after the abuse ended. Living in self-sabotage, living in self-doubt sabotaged a lot of my success. So that old trusty demon of self-doubt, how has it shown up in your journey now? Now that you're out of the abusive relationships, now that you've gotten therapy, Now you're on the road, you're a published author, you're out here in these social media streets. How has that self-doubt showed up? And how are you dealing with it? Anytime you put yourself out there by doing something new, if it's starting a business, if it's Mm -hmm. starting a new job, there's always that place in your mind where you want to question, am I worthy? There's always that place in your mind where you question, am I qualified? And there's that place where you question, why was I chosen to do this? So there's always that, you know, I don't know if it's just, I don't know who to blame, rather it's my own mind or Satan or just other people or not being there yet. When you don't experience success on the level that you know you're capable of or the level that you are desiring, sometimes that that self-talk comes up and you have to then say, no, I am worthy. I can do this. And then you have to realize why is this coming up? Is it coming up because it's not what I see? Well, then I have to tell myself, well, we don't walk by what we see. We walk by faith. And so a lot of times I don't see the millions of book sales. I haven't been on the New York Times bestseller list yet, but I know that everybody who's read my books have come back to me and said, you know what? This really made me think. This really made me change. This was so impactful. So I have to keep pushing and I don't have to keep pushing just for myself. I have to keep pushing to prove to my daughter, to prove to the other women who are out there right now who may be watching this. And just last night, they were hit upside their head by their lover or Mm. to the man who may be in an abusive relationship. They may come across this right now and say, you know what, I'm going through this, but here's someone who went through it. And now look at what she's doing to help others. Look at how, and even if they don't take that path, you know, because yes. keeping it to yourself is also part of the shame and part of not moving on because you hide it. So even mm-hmm. if you don't want to tell the world, you need to talk to somebody. But mm-hmm. it frees you in that aspect when you get it off your chest. It's just like anything when you're frustrated or angry, upset, sometimes just whew, letting yeah. it go <laughs> and getting mm-hmm. out can help you in so many ways. So I just keep reminding myself that I am worthy. I am capable. The past is the past. And I'm not going to let the past dictate my present or my future. And that's what I do to get over that doubt. 
Amen. That's it. Because that old demon of unworthiness and shame, I think those are the two biggest demons, unworthiness and shame, and it will whisper in your ear. So I love that. I love that. And the fact that you keep standing and pushing because you do have fruit. Every time someone comes back to you and say, that really blessed me, that's fruit. And the Bible says that we will have fruit that remains. And so it's a, it's a matter of pressing on, pivoting, shifting. And like we said, you can't really help people if you're hiding. So healing causes you to, to, to diminish the hiding. And the more we come out, the more people we can help. So self-doubt will creep in. and then. Here's a question. And again, you see that I am quoting from your book because I want to bring it out, right? So, bring it up. <laughs> bring it out. So this is what you said. You guys are quoting straight from this book. The thing that made me come to my senses was when I called the police again and they took us both to jail. The officer was kind enough to wait as I called my sister to pick up my child before he took me into custody. When I applied to law school 15 years later, I had to disclose that I was taken into custody. Although I was not arrested, it was super frustrating trying to work toward my dreams and living in fear that the past could interfere with my future. When you apply for admission to the bar, they are going to scrutinize everything about your life. That's why law schools do the same. Regardless of what it looks like, your present situation can make you make or break you. The choice is yours. If you are in an abusive relationship, leave ASAP. And so my question to you is, what would you say to the woman who's in an abusive relationship right now? She wants to share her story. She wants to write her book, but she's worried about what you're talking about here, the past coming to haunt her. What would you say? I would say the past has no power over your present or your future. Because when Jesus died on the cross, yeah. he didn't just die for the people who were alive then. He died for the people who had already died. He died for the people who were living. And he died for the people who hadn't been born yet, who would die in the future. So that when we die, we can be reunited with Christ. So there is no reason that I should even think that my little past, which is no comparison to what Jesus did when carrying the whole world on the cross, if he did that, then my little past and my little bit in this life, that wasn't what I wanted to look like. That's nothing. That is absolutely nothing. So you got to put that in perspective. That was just a little bit of your life. I was in that relationship for two years, but I'm 46 years old. So that was a little portion of my entire life. And that is not going to dictate how the rest of my life goes, because everything that I do, everything that I've said, right or wrong, is still covered under the blood. And so what I have to do now, my job, by what Jesus has allowed me to live, to do, is walk in my purpose. And that purpose is to share my story. And for somebody else listening, part of your purpose is just to share your story. Somebody may relate to you. There might be someone listening who's only 19 or 20 years old going through this. Well, you may not connect with me as a 46 year old woman, but maybe there's someone else who went through it who's your age and they're going to connect with you. But if they're not sharing their story because they're afraid, then, hey, you're missing out on your purpose because you cannot beat God's giving. And that does not always mean financially. Sometimes your word your presence, your acts, and your deeds can deliver somebody else. So don't hold that back from them. Mm, 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 mm. All right. She just, she's laying it out, you guys. She's doing a lot of mic drops. So you got to listen really carefully to what she's saying. But she's going in here and really telling us how not to be a slave to our past. You know, and that reminds me, you know, because I dealt with the same issue. I was unforgiving to myself because of the mistakes I made, the mistakes I made being a parent, being strung out in a dead end relationship. I walked around with this minister's deceased wife's ring on my finger. He was a widow, walked around with her ring on my hand for almost seven years as my engagement ring. Can you imagine that walking around with a dead lady's ring and hiding in Walmart where you saw the people from your old church? Because you're like, I'm leaving to get married to a pastor. We, I'm still walking around with this mm -hmm. lady's ring and we ain't married yet. And it's five years later, I hide in Walmart when I saw somebody yes. from the old church. <laughs> you know, so I had shame. Yeah. Right? And then I had to remind myself, you know, the call in the Bible killed all those Christians, did all of that murdering. And God still used him to write half, most of the New Testament. Then certainly my little mess, my little shame, you know. 
He can still use me. So like Rhonda said, if you're listening and you're in that place, don't let your past supersede your present. So now we're going to shift a little bit. Um, I want to think about what want you to um, tell us a little bit about some of the emotional highs and lows that you've experienced in your journey, just specifically in business and as an author, being out here on the so in social media streets, starting your business, emotional lows and highs, and how did you come out of lows? How do you okay. work with God to do that? As far as the business is concerned, there's the emotional highs when you have someone who goes to your website and orders. That means, hey, someone saw me out here posting on social media because I don't even know this person. Because in the beginning, it's all your friends and family supporting you. But then when you start to have orders of people you've never met, it's like, okay, that's that <laughs> emotional high. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you have the lows where a month or two goes by, nothing, no Crickets. sales. Cricket. Right, 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 right. <laughs> <I know. laughs> and you're wondering, what am I doing wrong? Um, just last week, I asked myself, God, when, when, when is this going to happen? And God was like, listen to what you're saying. Just hear yourself. And I thought I was saying W-H-E-N, when, but what it sounded like was when, W-I-N. And it's things like that where the Holy Spirit encourages you. And you have to also encourage yourself. Because I still keep, when people send me text messages or private messages, I will screenshot them when they say, hey, this was excellent. Because that way I have something to go back to reference in those moments where I'm on those emotional lows because my business didn't mm -hmm. sell but one book this month. <laughs> so oh, I have to make sure that is what helps me to keep going. I also have to give myself grace. When you're doing something you have not done before, you can't be so hard on yourself because the win is in pushing. If you quit, you're never going to win. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have to keep on, you know, doing whatever it is, reaching out to people, reaching out to shelters, reaching out to people on social media to let them know I exist. I'm here. I have this book. I have this product for you. And I'm here to serve you through what I have created. And Amen. that's how I you know, navigate those highs and lows. I love that. Did you guys catch that? Because she's actually taken the feedback, the positive feedback that she receives so that when she hits a low moment, she can pull that back out. That's almost like going back. It's similar to remembering answer prayer, going back through your prayer journals and all and looking back over your life at all, all the things that God brought you through when you're in a low moment and think, well, he got me out of this. Now I'm here and I'm still standing and I thought I couldn't make it through that situation, but I'm still here. Well, she's doing it for her business. She's like, she's pulling back the good feedback, the times where people said that was excellent. And she's using that when she's in her lows and when she's when in her win, God, win moments. Yeah, I know, I know, right? Exactly what you're talking about. When you have those dry seasons mm -hmm. and it's crickets, this is excellent advice. So. Share with us any specific times where you got in your feelings, you know, that phrase, you're in your feelings, where you actually really got in your feelings and made a mistake. And how did you recover emotionally it's when it comes to your business or even in professional, like in a professional sense? Well, let's talk about business in the sense of finances, because I'm also an investor. I trade um, in the stock market. So that's an easy way to explain that you cannot get attached to your money. That money is not attached to you. So it is there to serve a purpose. And so a lot of times if I make a bad trade and lose my money, sometimes I'm trying to make it back from the exact same stock that I lost it on. I'm like, no, you're going to give me my money back today. And that's not how it works. So you have to sometimes <laughs> take a step back, take a deep breath. Don't be an emotional trader. And that ties over to business as an author, because I have to make sure I am not guiding and making decisions based on my emotions. I'm making sound decisions based on my business mindset, not my emotional feelings. It also helps to keep so yourself surrounded by other business owners because they may not be in the same field as you. They may have a totally opposite business, but we experience the same things. Because in business, there's certain things that you all have to do, no matter what the business is, there are challenges you're going to face, 
And you need other people to bounce ideas off and see how they overcame those challenges as well. Awesome. I love what you said about business mind. Say that again. I have to think with my <laughs> business mind. My, my, business, <laughs> my business mind. So I like to say, put your business mind set on, put your business thinking cap on, get out of your emotions, get out of your feelings, because I'm an emotional person. You know, I'm the type of person I could cry watching the news. So <laughs> I can't be that way in business. You know, I'll be boohoo crying and 24 hours has passed by and I hadn't solved the problem, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you have to get out of the emotional side of you and put your business mindset on. I love that. I love that. And so we got a few more questions and then we'll wrap this up. But the other question I had, what practices, rituals, or habits that you use to keep you centered and sane? Because this is the Well-Centered Woman podcast. So like daily practical things that you do every day, day in and out. I know you're going into the FDBL room on Clubhouse. <laughs> yes, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> That's my plug. Oh, you do? <laughs> yes. What else do you do that keeps you settled, centered, and sane while you're walking in purpose? You're still working a full-time job. Tell us a little bit more about the full-time job and then the practices that you do to navigate and stay centered with doing that. Right. Like most people, if you have a full-time job, that's probably 40 to 50 hours of your work week. That's a huge chunk of your time. That's why I can't wait and thank God for the day <laughs> where I can walk away. But until then, I have to make sure that I am uh, organized in my life. That's what helps keep me centered. So on Sundays, I will sit down with my calendar and plan out my week. It's kind of like doing a to-do list for your time. So I know, hey, between nine and five, I'm at work. From five to 5.45, I'm on the road. I know on which day of the week I'm going to either listen to some Spanish lessons or I'm going to listen to a sermon while I'm driving back home or I'm going to listen to some Bible scriptures. That helps me stay centered because I have that routine. I have something to um, mm -hmm. continue to grow, um, do my personal development and use my time wisely. In addition, during lunch, I will usually walk if the weather permits. Most people don't understand how much exercise mm -hmm. can help you you know, gets the blood flowing, gets the blood to the brain, you know, so it helps you um, with stress as well. So even if you're mm -hmm. not in the gym running three or four miles on that treadmill, just a walk outside, get your sunlight, get your vitamin D. Mm -hmm. I also take yes. my vitamins. And that's one thing I do a wellness week in my program, where I tell people, you know, get some exercise, Take your vitamins for 30 days straight. See how it makes you feel. Because a lot of times, even depression can be fought mm -hmm. by getting the right minerals and vitamins in your body. So there's certain things like that that I make sure are part of my routine. Another thing that I do is I give my daughter a hug. Um, if you're married, you have a spouse or children or a roommate, give them a hug. Because sometimes that physical touch is all we need to make us feel better. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. And I hear you about your to-do list for your time. I call it being a bulldog. I'm a bulldog okay. about my time. I don't let people waste my time. And so like, give me a calendar request. I'm like Google calendar queen, Outlook calendar queen, <laughs> everything. Very organized in terms of really trying to structure my time. And I believe that your routine, you have a routine and a rhythm to your life. That's what's keeping you centered as a woman of God, as an entrepreneur, working a full-time job. Up. Routine is the foundation of sanity. Chaos. And prayer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and prayer. Gotta pray. <laughs> yes. Yes. And having a prayer life. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead. I'm going to wrap this up. Already. Yes. I have <laughs> two more questions. Two more questions. We're good on the time. What advice would you give your younger self? Ooh. What looking back on where you were, say, let's say 20 years ago, you say you're 46 years old. What advice, knowing what you know now, going through the hell and the lessons you've learned and the wisdom you've gained and how God has delivered you? You have a powerful testimony. Those of you, I'm going to have the link to her, all of her website and everything in the show notes to this uh, uh, podcast. But she has a powerful story. And I remember, in particular, what's coming to my mind. The one where you were fighting in the dark and the enemy whispering in your head and it was so dark 
and how you pushed through and called on the name of Jesus. When you look at the total, totality of all you've been through, what would you tell 26-year-old Rhonda? I would tell 26-year-old Rhonda, one, never give up. Keep the faith in Jesus Christ. No matter what happens, mm -hmm. keep your faith and stay grounded in God's word. Two, I would say be obedient to God's word. Don't follow the crowd. Don't let people influence you or make you stray away from what you know. Mm -hmm. I would also say spend more time with my daughter because they grow up so fast <laughs> and you can't get that time back. Um, you know, the job will always be there. And if that job can't understand that family's first, go find another one or start your own business earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I would also tell my younger self to invest earlier, rather that's real estate or the stock market. I would tell my younger self to take care of your older self and begin now to do that. Mm -hmm. I think those are the pieces of advice I would give my younger self. Oh, you guys hear that? What else? You got some more? I was going to say, even if the events of my life didn't change, if I knew that young, as a younger person, even if the events, because we can't change the past. And that's one thing that as a survivor, I was very stuck on. What if I had only not dated this person? But we can't get stuck on that because that's regret. So we don't want to mm -hmm. live in a place of regret. So even if nothing changed about the things in my life, I would still follow those same pieces of advice, but I would hold on to those things even tighter. Amen. Amen. I love that. Mm, I love that. So here's the last question. Why do you think, or rather, I guess this is the, I'm trying to get this question right. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel like the best lessons in life take the longest to learn? What was the best lesson you had? And did it take a long time to learn it? You know, I think the best lesson is for each of us to truly be who we are. As a kid, we are born into this world, a clean slate, and everybody's trying to mold us into something. They're trying to mold us based mm -hmm. on who they are. But the Bible says, train up a child in the way he or she should go. And that means whatever their purpose in life is. So as a parent, now you've got to figure out yours and theirs. It's like a parent who sees that their kid is gifted in the arts. So they put them in an art school or a parent who sees their kid is, you know, really good at talking. So now you have these kids on Instagram talking with the wisdom of a 90 year old. Yes. So you've got to figure out what it is, who you are created to be and shed off those layers that other people have put on you so you can really be you. Because when you find you and you find that inner peace and that happiness there, you're on top of the world. There is nothing like being a place of just peace mm -hmm. and resting in you. And you can rest, there's a saying you rest in Jesus. At the same time, Jesus created you to be someone. Do you really know who that person is? Mm -hmm. That's so true. And you're right. That's the longest lesson to learn. Why is it so long to learn? Because we got to spend half of the time unpacking and getting rid of the false self, all of the layers, all of the expectations, all of the shame, the guilt, the condemnation, regret, past mistakes, forgiving ourselves, giving ourselves compassion, giving ourselves grace so that we're real. Because how can I learn how to accept and be my real authentic self if I'm rejecting myself, right? right. And if and you so ever talk to someone who's older, who they only, they not only share their wisdom from their life experiences, but they can really tell you what's truly important. Mm, mm, that's so true. That's true. I agree with you. The biggest and the best lesson is to really learn how to show up and be authentically and fully yourself. And we'll, we'll be 80 and 90 years old, finally just now accepting, because you know, that's why older people, they don't care what people mm -hmm. think. The older you mm -hmm. get, the less you start worrying about, because by that point you become comfortable in your own skin. Can you speak to, when did you really, really get in your group and begin to really be comfortable being Rhonda 
and like really settling into who you are without trying to front and fake and, you know, all this comparison. There's a lot of comparison out here in these streets and the enemy can whisper with that as an entrepreneur as well. Can you speak to that? Last year. <laughs> <laughs> Just last year? Just Go. last year. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what it is about your 40s. You know, I heard Oprah say it um, one time on her show that when she got in her 40s, things seem to just come together. It's like you start to figure out life. And I don't know if it's because you realize, okay, you know, I'm 40, I'm 50, maybe I'm halfway to my life mark on this earth. Mm -hmm. um, so you really begin to appreciate things. Even when I'm driving down the road, I see the trees and I'm like, God, look at all the pretty shades of green. You know, you're such an awesome God. You made this for me to enjoy while I'm here on this earth. And so you start to appreciate things and notice things you would not have before. And I guess, you know, that's also part of recognizing who he created you to be. And when you get into that place, it's like, I'm here, world. I'm and here. even if y'all don't see me, I'm still here. Amen. If you don't see me, if you don't like me, I'm still here and I'm going to be fine. Because mm -hmm. when, when our self-esteem has been compromised, it takes a lot to learn how to like yourself, to really love yourself and embrace yourself and to get to that point where you're really, really comfortable with yourself and not be triggered up by certain things. So it's just so many layers to it. It is so many. And you're saying you just got there last year? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, you know, I think it's a process. I, it I feel is like because I'm 50. <laughs> you know, and I feel like I like now I'm really at that point. Like I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm gonna say what I need to say. I'm always gonna be respectful. Um, but I'm just not gonna be one of these, you know, I, I'm gonna be my real full 100 percent self. And yes. that takes a lot because. It, it will it will make you quickly see who can accept you and who can deal with you and who can't because sometimes I'm maybe too much for some right and that's and hard the, I know but that's their problem not yours <laughs> one of the exercises I tell women to do is sit down and write out what you want your life to look like and put it on your bathroom mirror and every day when you get up you read that to yourself you can say you know I am a loving wife, or I am a caring mother of three, whatever it is you want your life to look like and talk to yourself. Hey, mm -hmm. Rhonda, you look good today. Hey, Rhonda, I'm glad that you're such a kind hearted person. You showed someone love today. Those are the kind of things you also can encourage yourself and it helps you get to know yourself when you talk to yourself. I mean, we talk to other people to get to know them, mm -hmm. but what about our self-talk? Come on, the self-talk. Sometimes we talk about ourselves worse than we talk to. That inner self-talk can be pretty brutal. And it's right. the, and our body hears it, our conscious hears it, our subconscious hears it, our spirit hears it. And we're talking down to ourselves and saying all this stuff in our head. Girl, you stupid. All kinds of stuff. And it's not helpful. Are you a big journaler as well? Do you journal? Okay, so here's the thing, and this is going to take us back to my abusive relationship in college. Wow. I, yeah, I had a journal. I would journal from middle school through high school, college, and every day I would write in it faithfully. My first, boy, first abusive boyfriend in college found my journal in my dorm room. He took it out. I don't know why he did this, but he tore and ripped every page out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I no longer journaled like I used to. Um, I will write certain things down, but usually there are things about scripture or if I'm reading a book, I will write in the pages of the book how that relates to me. But I don't actually journal anymore. And that's that's just something I had not picked back up. Wow. Wow. I remember I had a friend who had a similar situation where she, you know, in her parenting, um, her, well, I think it was a stepdad or somebody made it, made it to where she's not wanting to write, mm -hmm. you know, when you get traumatized in that area. So yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. But you're still a writer because you've written. 
You read books. Right. Because so <laughs> I'm writing in a different way. <laughs> it's a different kind of a writing. Yes. Wow. Wow. And who knows? Maybe that's what God needed me to do because everything happens for a reason, even though I may not be journaling. And I even pray to God sometimes. I'm like, God, you know what? I'm sure I wrote things in that book that I don't even remember. Jog my memory, jog my childhood memory of something maybe I wrote down. I can't go back and read it. So one thing I have done, though, is when my daughter was born in 1999, I started writing letters to her and I gave it to her for her 18th birthday. Now we just periodically write to each other. So you know how you might have those moments you don't want to talk to your kid, <laughs> but we can write each other and be like, you know what? I can't talk to you right now, but I still love you. And I know we're going through and tomorrow would be better. And we can wow. exchange that book. So there's not any journaling for me personally, but I do put my words and thoughts in books for other people to read. That's awesome. That's awesome. I know journaling has been a very powerful pro practice for me because that's where my books have come from. That's where my, a lot of my social media comes from and all the things that I produce. It starts off in those journals. You know, that first book came out of a journal where I was just crying. I could barely, it's a good thing I could make blog posts out of it because the actual pages of where, you know, had tear stains, mm -hmm. looking all messy and stuff. So it's, um, you know, it's, process different for everybody. So as we close this out, tell us a little bit more. Tell us about everything you're doing, your current projects, what you have to offer, your courses, books, how people can get in contact with you so that um, they can connect with you and follow you on social media and your website and everything. So tell us what you have going on. Sure. Well, first, I want everyone who's listening to go to my website, rondagreen.com. R-H-O-N-D-A-G-R-E-E-N.com and get the copy of Seven Ways to Free Your Mind After Abuse. Even if you were not in an abusive relationship, there are some tips in there that will help you in life and help you either detach from someone or open your eyes to some things that may be red flags that you have not recognized. And then if you want to read my other books, How Much Is Your Dirt Worth is available on my website as well as on Amazon. You can also get my ebook, 40 Questions Before First Date. And that was the most recent book that I wrote. If you are like me in your 40s and maybe still single, that's a great thing because I enjoy the single life. And one reason I enjoy it so much is because I don't have to waste my time because I know the right questions to ask so that I don't end up in the wrong relationship. Come on, so somebody. 40 <laughs> questions before the first date will help you navigate the dating scene in today's world. I also have a e-course. It's a six-week e-course for survivors of domestic violence. We talk about everything from health and wellness, finances. We talk about hope, love, healing. We have assignments, we have exercise videos, we have all kinds of resources, including one-on-ones with me to help you get back to being you, get your life back on track and live the happiest life possible. Awesome, awesome. And she, her material, especially the seven ways to free your mind, that particular book, she has some very point, uh, some key points that I look at in terms of how to really cut a soul tie with somebody, really cutting yourself off emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, emotionally from that ex. And I highly encourage you to just check that out. Just some simple strategies um, that she has in there. So that's really good. And so we really appreciate you for being here and joining us on the Well-Centered Woman podcast. You have dropped a lot of gems. So I'm going to have fun going back through this and re-listening. And you're going to hear it um, when it comes out soon. But thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. God bless you. And you'll be back on. I'm going to bring you back around again. And we're going to, we're <laughs> going to check in with your progress on how you're doing. So and my new journal, maybe I'll read yes. some pages or something. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So thank you. And we'll be back out here again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Tanika.